because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Awesome today to have uh, Coach Joe Prunty with us, and uh, Coach has had so many experiences at so many levels of basketball, and great to have him here, both as a former head coach and a former assistant coach in the NBA, and Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. Great to talk with you. Well, Coach, uh, I wanted to start a little bit with some organizational culture stuff, and uh, we probably don't talk about it enough on this podcast. We're going to get in some nexus nose and some technical tactical, but since you've been a part of championship teams and organizations, besides great players and luck, what has to happen to win a championship in the NBA? What are some other factors that we need to consider more as coaches? Those are two of the bigger ones. And I think there's always a th- the third one that I would always look at in terms of the big factors is health. Uh, a lot of times, you know, being a good team, uh, health and luck are the three main factors that I would think of. But then within those, there's uh, so many things that go into each one of those categories. Uh, but you could even look at it this year. Uh, the And it, it isn't just for the one series it's throughout an entire series, right? You know, you look at the Warriors and the Raptors this year, just health played a factor in it. You can look at the Warriors first run. So many people were quick to say, well, they didn't beat teams at full strength. That's not their fault. That is the way that, that it played out. Those teams had advanced. Those were their opponents and they had to make sure that they beat those teams So health is really, really important for not only, obviously, the team that advances, but sometimes it's just being healthier than your opponent because both teams are going to be banged up, uh, especially as you get all the way to the finals. And then, like I said, good teams, uh, you know, like you said, it's talent, it's chemistry, it's trust. There's so many things that go into that on a day-to-day basis that help you get to the end of the season. Is chemistry overrated or underrated, in your opinion, especially when it comes to the NBA? Like, does everyone have to get along to have a successful team? Or what, what are we talking about when we're talking about chemistry? It's often talked about and uh, probably not as understood as uh, it needs to be. Well, chemistry counts. There's no question about it. And it doesn't necessarily mean everybody is best friends and they do everything together. That helps years ago. I think it was the uh, 2014 championship for the Spurs. Patty Mills gave a great speech in there at their parade. And it talked about how much that team got along and how much they liked each other, not only on the court, uh, but off the court as well. You could see that when they were playing their games. You would see dead ball situations where they weren't timeouts. Uh, let's say somebody was shooting a free throw for either team and you would have guys with their arms around each other, whispering in their ear, telling them something about the next play or something that had just happened that they saw. And you could see that uh, what pop had really instilled was the player's ability that year. And a lot of teams that get that far, but in particular, that team, their ability to coach one another. And that's part of chemistry is willing to listen to someone willing to be able to give them a willing to give them advice and be able to say it in the proper way that doesn't make somebody feel offended or feel belittled or anything like that. So chemistry is very important and I don't want to say it's overrated or underrated, but I will say it's it's a term that I think people just throw out there and chemistry actually to me would be a verb. It's something that you create. It's something that you do on a daily basis. It's every single day you're doing things that help build it, create it, and and it can be torn apart quickly. Well, that's great. I love that you made it a verb, and you're absolutely right on that. And Coach, building into that then, talk about staff and staff chemistry a little bit in the staff meeting. And what makes a productive staff mm-hmm. meeting? Because obviously, I mean, the big challenge at the NBA level is staffs are getting bigger. And uh, you have such a blend of coaches. So can you talk a little bit about the value and obviously – How do we make a productive staff meeting? Yeah, it's a great question because staffs are getting bigger. You do have 
tremendous minds and you want to be able to tap into those knowledge. And I think you have situations where you start your meeting and you want to make sure that you're focused on a particular task, that you are collaborative in your efforts, and you're really trying to generate answers to questions or problems that might be short-term or long-term. Your staff meetings vary a little bit in terms of how they're run because it depends on what you're doing. And when I say that, are you having a meeting? Is it a pregame prep? So are you doing your meeting before your shoot around? When you're having that meeting, it's going to be very focused on your opponent, but it doesn't mean that you're not talking about your team, the health of your team, you know, who's going to be available. Is it a back to back? How many minutes is somebody, you know, really capable of playing that night based on if you went, let's say you went double overtime the night before. Well, it's, you know, that game's going to be harder and your, your discussions around, you know, how best to utilize players is going to come into play. If you're talking about, if you're having a meeting, just to determine what you're doing for practice that day. And maybe the night before you've already had a discussion on the things that you think you need to work on based on the way the game had gone. So there's, there's several different meetings that you will have and how they'll work. But like I said, I think the key ingredients to them are everybody participating. And a lot of times there's teams now have offensive and defensive coordinators, but that doesn't mean you can't go into somebody else's realm, so to speak, and have a comment because there are very knowledgeable people in that room. And if one guy feels like, well, I just do the offense, so I can't comment on the defense, then you may be missing something that can make a big difference either that night, the following week, or maybe even in the playoffs. Yeah, it's interesting. And and getting everyone to talk has got to be challenging in some ways, too, because there's confidence. There's certainly some people that have that personality. So have you seen specific actionable strategies that coaches have used that that you like to be able to generate discussion, but also the right amount of discussion? Because I think the other challenge is that some people probably talk too much when you can make a point in a shorter time. So what are some things maybe that you've seen practically? There, no question. And that's the one thing we all have to understand is we have a finite amount of time to get through something. Obviously, you can make your meetings longer, but a lot of times you have other responsibilities as a head coach or even as you know assistant coaches. You have the players that you want to get your workouts in uh, with before or uh, after your meetings. Um, you have to make sure that your schedules are organized with uh, your strength and conditioning staff, your medical staff to coordinate everything. So I think the head coach, the big thing is just creating the culture, not only within the staff of allowing people to feel like they can contribute uh, and making sure that not only are they feeling like they can contribute, but that they can defend their point. I think a lot of times in meetings, people will have a point and they may get cut off before they can explain why they feel that way. And sometimes the why is the most important thing that needs to be heard, even if everybody agrees on a particular topic. So the head coach creates that culture in terms of any meeting, but also within a meeting to drive where the conversation is going to go. I think one idea that I had learned a long time ago was just I've been, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of great coaches, but a lot of times with one particular coach, he already had ideas of things that he wanted to do, but he wanted to generate the conversation among the staff to get them thinking if they hadn't already been thinking about a topic. And if they had maybe draw out some type of answer that might maybe change the decision of an individual or a group to make the staff better. So the culture that you create like I said, is not only within the staff, within an organization, it can be within just one individual meeting. Yeah, I know. It's fascinating stuff. And, you know, it's got to be a challenge for any coach and, and something that people don't think about. I mean, think about X's nose and t- team chemistry, but really organization right. and, uh, you know, execution of staff is is got to be a huge part of it. So, Coach, you've coached right. internationally. You've been in the NBA for a long time. You've seen so many trends. What are some trends maybe the last few years that maybe we aren't talking about enough or they are just coming forward? You know, obviously we know threes and at the rim, but 
Are there some trends that you're seeing that are coming out that we'll see over the next few years? Well, the one interesting thing that happened this year that I hadn't seen a lot of was uh, Nikola Meritic leaving to go back to Europe. You hadn't seen that a lot in terms of a guy that you felt was going to have, like the the stories were, there was a lot of money that might be offered. But, you know, I, I don't know the situation for him at all. I wouldn't even try to speculate. But I think a lot of people, the, the dialogue in the, you know, the narrative in the, you know, the articles was that it was just something that he wanted to do. And I think that's great in terms of what he thought was best for him and his situation and his family. And it was followed up. I had seen an article by Mirza Toledovich talking about it, saying that, you know, more players might do that. And I thought it was very interesting in seeing it from the standpoint of it hadn't been talked about much that uh, guys would want to go back and play. But that having been said, I've also been with players like uh, Rudy Fernandez in Portland and Sergio Rodriguez, you know, who went back overseas and have had tremendous careers and absolutely have loved it. You know, Sergio was a EuroLeague Final Four and he did come back and play in the NBA, but it was one of those things where that was best for them. I don't know if that's a trend, but that's something that happened this year that I saw. I was like, oh, I wonder if that's something that could happen a little bit more often. As far as play, one thing that may be a little bit more of a change in the last few years, I remember coming into the league quite a few years back and, you know, teams had a significant amount of plays and not that they didn't make reads and uh, execute different things off of that. You know, and in, in any pick and roll, for example, there's a million reads that take place that people don't think about, but, Everybody sees it as a just simple, okay, this guy sets the screen, this guy comes off, and now you play. Uh, there obviously is more to it. But in in Europe, a lot of times, especially in Eurobasket, we would have teams that had very few plays, but multiple options, and they were outstanding at making the reads out of them. I think as you watch a lot of the teams here that are having success, there's a little bit more of that. You know, again, going back to the 2014 Spurs, that was one of the things people loved was uh, how well they moved the ball, uh, how well they made a play after the play. So they were running something, but then what really caught everybody's eye was their ability to make the extra pass, make the right read, share the ball. And I think you've seen that with the teams that have gone on the last five, six years here that have won championships. You know, not that individuals aren't going out and making plays, but the spacing, as you said, the ability to shoot it, the ability to read the situation and make a play in a split second. So we're talking about actions more than plays, that there's certain actions that teams want to blend together. Is that what kind of what we're referring to here? A lot of teams have different terms for it. Uh, some teams might say flow. Some teams might play the after, call it the after action. Some teams may call it the play after the play, but it's more the idea of once a play breaks down or once a defense gives you some type of an option, meaning they've been hedging on a pick and roll and now all of a sudden the center has dropped all the way back or, you know, that's a, I wouldn't say that's a great example, but you have a a coverage that you haven't seen yet. Now you have to make that read in the play, even though the play was the same, the play after the play becomes different because the read is different. Um, You know, a lot of times it's easier to see if teams have, uh, for example, their center back in a pick and roll. And then all of a sudden they go to, they change their coverage to a blitz. How quickly does that team react? And a lot of times, in these games, it isn't just pick and rolls like with the Warriors. There's several screening situations, and they're very organized with what they do in terms of Thompson and Curry being able to run off of screens. But it's the idea that we're not necessarily running plays as much as we're getting the ball up into our offense quickly, playing with some pace full court, and then playing with pace half court 
reading situations and making not only ourselves better, but our teammates without necessarily having to run a lot of plays. And I I had this discussion with an NBA assistant in in Vegas for summer league. And the concept kind of came forward that it, it might be in our best interest to start thinking about teaching these end of actions before we actually teach plays because of their importance, right? In determining outcome, because inevitably whatever play you're running, there's going to be these reads and these decisions that happen that again, a good defense is going to take you out of primary actions. So you've got to flow in your secondary or your reactions, penetration, reaction, offensive reaction, et cetera. So is that a mindset coming forward in terms of you think that'll change the way coaches approach things? Or have you already seen that a little bit in terms of practice structure? I believe we've already seen it. I think that's the, that's, it's already been going that direction. I think, you know, players continually are getting smarter and smarter, you know, in their ability to see the things that they see, the speed at which they see it. Now, the more veteran team you are, the easier it is. The younger you are, the harder it is. And it doesn't mean you still can't teach these things. It just takes more time for those concepts to be grasped by an individual and therefore by the team as a whole. And that can be things that we might seem think or might think are as simple as spacing. Hey, you know, one guy gets in the corner, one guy gets on this wing, one guy on this wing, one for younger teams, sometimes that's a little bit harder. Not because uh, they can't get it. It's that they just need more reps and more experience doing it. It's great stuff. And there's that you mentioned cutting and there are, or, you know, holding the corner or cutting or different things like this that happen. And certainly cutting is something that's evolved a lot at the NBA level and in and, and Europe, obviously, I think for years, but cutting off of drives, cutting off of you know, ball screen, cutting all these second cuts and these 45 cuts and different things like that. Is is that something that's being taught or is that players making decisions and then coaches adjusting from there? Or how is that process evolving within teams? I'm sure with everybody, there's different philosophies, but it clearly is something that is, is taught in some situations and in others, it's a player's natural instinct or something that they've done since they were in college or maybe even before that. It is, it is a valuable tool to utilize within an offense, in particular when it's not necessarily part of a play. If you go back quite a few years, you know, Corey Maggette was one of the better players at cutting out of the corner, and everybody knew it, and they almost called it his play, essentially. Like it was, he almost got, I think for some teams, they called it a Maggette cut. Yeah, we, we, we've called it, Coach, Coach. we've stole that. We call it a Corey cut, and I actually posted an edit yeah. of that. And people always, yeah, great to remember Corey McGetty because he was a heck of a cutter. Absolutely. And, you know, whether he scored or got to the free throw line, you knew it was coming and you'd, ha- you'd be prepared for it, yet he still found a way to get it. But I've been with teams that have, we have specifically taught players about where the read is, which player we wanted to cut, how we wanted to make sure the the floor was spaced not only uh, before the cut but after. It's it's not easy because if you don't get some type of harmony within the the spacing and the cutting, then it looks like a jumbled mess. And people say, "Oh my goodness, this offense is terrible." And what are they doing? And it really isn't that far off from a team getting it right, but. If you're cutting on top of each other or there is no outlets when a player drives it or a post player gets double teamed or a pick and roll ball handler gets double teamed, then it looks flawed. So I truly do believe that it is, you know, the cutting is something that is definitely being taught, but there is also a level of players are, like I said, players are smart. They learn to read the situation and and how quickly they can pick up when they can cut or when they need the space to allow the floor to be more open is huge. One other thing along those lines, it's always interesting. Like we think of cuts to the basket. Well, you know, the last few years, one of the things we've witnessed in particular with the Warriors, and it's not exclusive to them, but times where guys will drive into the lane, kick the ball out. And the tendency for most players is to stop 
but that's actually when some of the you know guys like Curry and Thompson become their most dangerous because they relocate and it's not considered a cut, but it's just nonstop movement that creates a shot or you know another opportunity for them or somebody else. I saw that interla- internationally last year when I coached over in Taiwan, and I swear the Korean team intentionally drove, jump stopped just to kick it out. So the player that kicked it out could sprint out and the speed that they did that and the, the pace that they moved the ball to that player to get it mm-hmm. back to them, it created great difficulty for our team and great pressure. And the, the Warriors example is a great example that those two guys are so dangerous after they pass out. So I'm glad you brought that to us, coach. Well, but it's also interesting that you say that because I don't know who did it first, whether it was the Warriors or, you know, the teams that you, you know, you mentioned your team but the team's overseas, but you can see there's, there's the impact right there. Somebody's influencing somebody else, right? That you've got this team's doing similar concepts, even though they're worlds apart. It's just tremendous. It makes basketball so fun to study and look at for sure. And uh, coach, let's put your high school coaching hat on, even though it's been forever, (laughs) but thinking about these conversations that we just had, let's say you went back and you were a high school coach. And I'll call it structure to unstructure, which is really what we're talking about. We're starting within a play, and then that play becomes unstructured, purposeful, but unstructured based on reads and stuff like that. What would change for you coaching that level now, knowing these things are evolving in the game and that these things can be really impactful at the high school level? Right. No, that's a great question. And I think that's I think that's really important. I think that's one of the things that when you look at success of international programs, it's what they've done at the grassroots level, um, for lack of a better, you know, for an all encompassing term. But what you do at the youth levels is so important because players, you know, their ability to learn things earlier, it makes it so much better in the long run. But you still can't get away from at that level, the fundamentals the little things that, you know, like being able to make the simple pass, everybody looks at somebody like going way back to like magic, or you can even talk about Jason Williams, guys that played with flash and there's more and more. And just, that's just to name a couple, obviously, but guys that were throwing the ball behind the back between their legs over their head, you know, the no looks, uh, all the different things that they did. They could do those things because the simple chest pass, the simple bounce pass, all those other things were easy to them already. They had mastered that, their ability to handle the basketball uh, and make a decision to get it to somebody else in a creative way was, you know, different than other people. At the high school level, if you can, if you come across players, which you do, uh, that have elite ball handling skills great vision and can see the floor. You want to make sure that those players have that ability to grow that talent, grow that skill, even to the degree that you would probably still have, even in the NBA, you talk about, Hey, if a guy's open and especially in a, you know, training camp in a preseason early in the year, if a player is open and he's doesn't look for the ball, it's actually not a bad thing to throw it. And if you hit him, what do you think he's going to do the next time he cuts in that same situation? He's probably going to look for it. So you want to grow this skill set because you want players to feel confident doing something that's going to lead to potentially, well, hopefully one easy basket, but multiple as your team evolves. So, you know, in high school at that level, I think what you're looking at is still trying to teach the fundamentals, still trying to teach the basic core values of basketball as your team evolves. And as you grow them, now you want to give them that freedom. I think what I've seen a little bit of through the years, it seems like there's a tendency for more pick and roll to be played. I'm not sure that's the best thing to do only because there's so much more to the game especially at that level. Uh, just the, like we talked about, cutting, reading situations. When you play pick and roll at a young age and guys are standing around, they don't necessarily, like even at, at the 
the highest levels, they don't necessarily always know, well, why do I just stand here on every possession and this is not fun? At the high school level, you want to try and grow guys um, as much as you can. And obviously you want to win, but there are so many aspects to games, the game for so many guys, like the 6'10 to 7 foot high school players, they used to be get on the block, stand here, we'll throw you the ball, you go score. Well, now a lot of those guys are skilled enough to, they're handling the ball on the perimeter. They're, you know, in some cases, they might be bringing the ball up the floor because they have good ball handling skills. And, you know, the guy that's guarding them isn't going to pressure them. But there's, I think for me going back, I'm still going to, if I were to do that, I'd still focus on the core values and the, you know, the fundamentals of what you'd always teach and then grow it from there based on the ability of your, your players. I think the better they are, the more freedom you're going to give them and you're going to want to see them grow and you're going to want to see them have success playing the game because that obviously is more fun and then it just becomes a cycle. Hey coach, just a quick interruption from the podcast. I just wanted to let you know I would love for you to join basketballmersion.com, of course, to help support all the online sharing I do. But I don't want to interrupt these podcasts for ads anymore. From now on, ads for Basketball Immersion events and products will be at the end of the podcast. I hope you will check them out. For instance, this week I'm sharing information about our BI Training Academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th. Go to www.basketballimmersion.com BI training to learn more or listen at the end of this podcast for more information. Now let's get back to the podcast. Well, it's great, great depth to that. And uh, I, I love the connection too that you made, which is like creativity comes from simplicity in a lot of ways. And that's the simplicity is, is that you're comfortable. You've got ball mastery skills, like you said, and then you can start to become this creative player that can, you know, throw the ball behind the back, whatever it is. And it's those principles. And I don't think we evolve it that much. I think sometimes we restrict it too much once they get to a simplicity and a fundamental skill. So I'm glad you made that connection as well, coach. It's a really, really fun part of the game. As you said, when players start to enjoy the game more because they can be more creative. Right. Skipping gears here, jumping gears a little bit. Between your experience of leading a team into the playoffs and being an assistant to some great coaches, coaches, what does it really mean to be an NBA head coach? What's expected of you? A lot. But, <laughs> you know, I think to be a, that's one topic in and of itself for, you know, X amount of days. But, you know, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous honor. But it, what it means to be a head coach, it means you're responsible to and for a lot of people. It means you can impact a company, a, you know, an organization, a livelihood, and in a lot of ways, communities, you know, cities, the impact. You know, look at how many people talked about what winning the championship was for all of Canada. And that's not just the head coach doing that. That's, it's, you know, it's never just one person. I think that's you know, would be a little bit misleading, but it's a tremendous responsibility to undertake. And so when you have that opportunity, you realize what a phenomenal experience it is to, you know, to build and be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Now the magnitude is what you make it. But I remember, I think it was actually Mark Cuban making a comment when Cleveland won their championship is if I think it, it was something to the, I, you know, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but the comment was something, if you don't think sports is important to cities, go look at this. And I, maybe it was, maybe it was in reference to their own championship, but it's something to be a part of it, let alone, uh, you know, when you're the head coach doing something like that. That having been said, a lot of people think being the head coach, it's, it's X's and O's, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's about the relationships, the passion that you bring, uh, having enthusiasm every day. You know, the job is really trying to develop people, build habits, uh, teach the game, teach different things, experiences that maybe, you know, you've been a part of uh, that other people haven't, uh, that your players haven't been a part of. Like you said earlier, it's about uh, the culture that you create within a meeting, uh, within an organization, you know, within basketball operations, it's collaborative effort with the GMs, the owners, uh, you know, 
all the different people that are involved within an organization. Well, it's an amazing, amazing thing to to have worn both those hats to, and uh, to to be able to reflect on that and you know how it shapes you and shapes your view of basketball. I no doubt that uh, it's been tremendous. Mm-hmm. But coach, I've also been told that you're known for your organizational lists. So I've got to ask, <laughs> why have you valued organization so much? And maybe practically give us some examples of what we're talking about when we're saying an organizational list, because no doubt it helps you as a coach, but what practically is an organizational list and why should we consider this as a coach? Well, the important part of being, I mean, obviously being organized is, is, is a huge skill to have. You know, I appreciate that you've been told that I'm curious as to the depths of what you've been told (laughs) of my organizational list, but that having been said, it's it, the important part of it is just being able to prioritize the things that you need to do. It helps you focus on not only short-term goals but long-term goals as well. And that's why you 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 know you have a vision on where you want things to go as a head coach, as an assistant coach, trying to um, you know help players, help the head coach doing the things that you need to do. So if you can stay organized and know how to prioritize what things need to get done, not only in a timely fashion, but in a lot of ways, in what order. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, the idea of telling a player right out of the gate, you're going to do a a spinning behind your back off your ankle pass before you teach him how to throw a chest pass is probably not the the right order to go in. Now, obviously I came up with one of the most absurd analogies that I could, but that's the idea is being able to prioritize these things so that you know, you are moving in the right direction and not skipping any, any steps. For me, organizations, partly something that was instilled, you know, when I was a kid through my parents and, you know, my family, but when I got to the NBA, kind of up the ante on it just from the standpoint of knowing that there was always another thing coming. There was, you know, so, okay, you have this project or this game. It wasn't always going to be about this game, meaning, okay, I have to get this edit and these things done or prepared, but you know what? I want to put this edit together on these point guards so our guys have it and can see it, or I want to put this. So I got to work on this periodically, but what if someone came along and said, Hey, for this game, can you get, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, all of Michael's shots in the fourth quarter, where are shots coming from? So we can see, you know, over the course of the game. Yeah. He's here, 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 here. But at the end of the day, he's getting his shots out of this pick and roll off of this spot or this isolation out of this spot. So you knew when it, was end of the game really critical what you had to prepare for but that's a different project that would just randomly come up so having been organized you're able to allot your time to do that the other thing that i was really fortunate a lot of times with early on in my career was the opportunity of not only breaking down film but guys would be coming in not late late but it varied anywhere from it'd be in the evening and it could be at any time but you know, if I was still down in the office, okay, now I can go out and, you know, rebound for a guy or put him through a workout or something like that. If I wasn't organized and I had these projects to get done, there's no way I was going to be, I would be, I wouldn't have the time to do that. So being organized and being able to prioritize all these things helped me because something else always came along and you just wanted to be prepared for it. It's a great connection to the time, time savings. Being organized just gives you time. It's it's so good. Coach, I guess it, this may be another trend, and I, I don't, certainly the way the game's going, I mean, just players are so much more skilled, but there's all these unique players now, too, that must make it a positive challenge, but a challenge, nevertheless, to be able to build offensive systems and defensive systems around some really unique players. Let's call them unicorns which is generally a term that's thrown out there for some of these players. But what what are some things that we need to think about when we're coaching these really unique players that probably didn't exist in the past a little bit more when we define positions very clearly? And now we're more in this positionless game. Right. That's, 
See, I think that's the approach that a lot of people have taken or the mentality that people have taken that it is positionless. And it's partially because players are doing multiple things. Again, alluding to what you and I had spoken about earlier, you have these 6'10 guys bringing the ball up the floor. I don't know how many people, and you know, I wouldn't say this is the best example, but I don't know how many people remember watching Shaq like at LSU or early in his career bringing the ball up the floor and, you know, spin and do all kinds of different things with the ball. Uh, you know, but again, a player of his size and his skill set uh, was, was rare and, you know, unheard of uh, to be able to do some of those things. But, you know, for me, I've been really, really blessed to be around a lot of great players and guys like, you know, I don't think people ever referred to Tim as a a unicorn in terms of, you know, okay, he's just really solid. But what that's what it was, was he's so fundamental, relatively speaking, with everything that he did. And if you had, if you stopped his move, he had that counter, whatever that counter was. And it was never about running the fastest or jumping highest. He was always capable of being in the right spot, which which is a fundamental skill in and of itself, just being in the right position, you know, being efficient with your movement. And so when you have a player of that magnitude uh, and his ability to impact the game defensively and offensively, he becomes what everybody calls, well, that's the anchor, right? Like that's the guy that's going to protect, protect the basket on the defensive end and go create a basket on the other end. And when I say that, it's because we could play through him and he could go make plays for himself or other people. Sometimes the best position to be in on the offensive end was in the weak side corner. Okay, they're going to double you. All right, be ready. Here it comes. And there was that corner three. Then you had guys like Dirk, who I was with the All Star in the All Star game in back to back years, have back to back photos. And the crazy thing is, I'm looking at the pictures one day a while back. And it's, you know, Tim and Dirk and Elton Brand and Yao Ming and all these guys in there, and Kevin Garnett, Stoudemire, the second tallest guy, I think, was Dirk. Every time I look, I'm trying to look at different angles. And, and nobody really remembered that how, like, you never realized how tall he was until you were around him. Um, but his ability to do the things that he did and the work that he put into it, I, you know, his work ethic is outstanding and tremendous. There's a reason he had the success uh, that he had. And with all the guys, you know, that you would deem as unicorns and, you know, or say that are unique players or special players, it didn't just happen. Uh, They made it happen. They went out and worked and put in the effort and energy that they needed to do, uh, needed to, to make them where they are. But, you know, Dirk's ability to just whether it was a big guy, know how to go against him, a small guy, know how to go against him. It was just amazing being able to put him in different positions. That actually was something that in my career helped me fast forwarding a few years later, working with a guy like Joe Johnson. We played a series, we were in Brooklyn playing against Toronto and we just were like, okay, let's, let's try and utilize Joe and put him in these different spots. And he just, flourished in the series against Toronto where, I mean, he dominated, uh, without being flashy, without flashing a ton of athleticism and anything that was extraordinary, but it was just efficient. It was play after play after play. Um, you know, being, uh, with teams where you have multiple long athletic players, uh, you know, you have to just be able to utilize that skill set. Uh, and this gets back to your point of, offense and defense what are the strengths of those players what are the things that you can use and know that you can get something positive to happen on the offensive end not that you're going to go to it every time but know that you can utilize it um okay what are the weaknesses and things that maybe they're not going to be best at even though they're an elite level player um, and at what pace are we going to make them better so you know, it's it's not only the offensive and defense of awareness of what guys can do, but it's the vision of what they can do within the framework of the team. And so, again, whether it's, you know, for me, guys like Tim, Dirk, 
uh, Joe and younger guys, uh, having younger guys like Kyrie Irving or Giannis when they were, you know, just coming into the league, you have to have a vision on where they can become. And you can see that, you know, those guys have, you know, just like the other ones have continued to have very good careers. So again, it's, I think it's special when you have unique players and guys that can do things that others can't, but you also have to have the vision of, uh, how you can help them help them themselves and their teammates. Yeah, it's a fun problem, no doubt. A fun problem about those Absolutely. type of players. No question. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, uh, maybe you can shed a perspective on this. How different is it scouting an opponent as a head coach versus an assistant coach? Since you've worn both hats, what, what's the difference? What are some of the main differences being an assistant preparing a scout for a team and being the head coach preparing for that same team? Yeah, it's a great question. And it really depends, especially within the assistant coach role, what your responsibilities are. Meaning, are you scouting the game as an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator? Um, Is it your scout? Meaning you're preparing the walkthrough and you're going to, you know, be the guy that's running the film session and so on and so forth. You know, those are two very distinct differences. And then obviously being the head coach. I think you're always going to start, um, you know, at the beginning of the season, sort of with a blank slate, even though you have an idea of what the coach's calls are, what the plays are going to be, what the personnel is. But you look at a a year like the year that's about to to happen. There's been so many players that have changed teams and so many. What you're going to see is going to be different than it has been in the past few years uh, because there's just been so much player movement. So you kind of go into it with a blank slate, looking at uh, trying to find the trends, trying to find things that they're doing on a consistent basis, not only as plays, but like we talked about earlier, the play after the play. So as a as an assistant coach, uh, you know, especially when it's your scout, uh, your main focus is is on the prep, like pulling out individual clips to make sure guys see them uh, and know tendencies being able to walk through the plays that are, you you don't want to inundate guys and make them paralyze, you know, what's it paralysis by analysis, but you don't want to paralyze guys uh, with, okay, if they run this play, you have to do this. If they run this play, that's very similar. Then we, you want to have common themes that uh, make sense. Then if you're the offensive or defensive coordinator, you're going to be looking at a little bit different trends. You're looking at bigger concepts as well. Like, This is how they play the pick and rolls. This is how they play post-ups, isolations, uh, screening situations to let the guys know where the open man's going to be. So, for example, not a lot of teams are running straight single double action. You know, the term obviously for most people is floppy. But if teams guarded it a certain way, you just wanted the guy that was coming off the screens to know where the open man would be. So quick. You just let them know, and then they make the read when they get in the game, but you're giving them the cheat sheet, essentially. Uh, as the head coach, obviously, it's a little more overall encompassing. You've got to know if you're an offensive and defensive coordinator, your focus is on one side. Uh, as the head coach, you can't do that. You're, you're focused on, on all of it. You know, Some coaches will learn all the play calls for other teams so that they can communicate it directly. Uh, some rely on their coordinators to yell out what plays are coming. You know, you also have to, like we said earlier about, you know, knowing tendencies. So when you're watching the films, you're picking those out to make sure you guys have a better understanding of, hey, if we're not double teaming in the post, this is the move the guy is going to go to. You've got to take that away. So let's say that, you know, the, the typical one would be the left shoulder, right hand jump hook. Okay, how much do you overplay that? You want to be able to give guys that are going to be defending in the post that insight. So as the head coach, you're overseeing all the things that need to be done and are ready to step in as our coordinators are running the scout to do their job. And that's what the meetings are for. And then when you get on the court, the, you know, sort of the, like I said, the freedom to, to run the show and then you step in as you need to. Did you have a unique or did you have anything in place to self evaluate yourself? post game after coaching games like was there a process of analysis for you always yeah I I would always reflect on you know there was uh for me I definitely would talk to the assistants 
you know, speak with other people within the organization, get their thoughts. Uh, obviously, you go back and watch film. You know, there were things that you set out in the game plan. And maybe it was plays you wanted to run. Maybe it was coverages you wanted to utilize, the adjustments that you wanted to make. Uh, you, you're going back and reevaluating those things. You know, maybe plays went exactly how you wanted and you won a game because you ran an end of game play. I always wanted to know exactly what we did and be prepared to actually go through things like that the next day while it was still fresh on their mind saying, hey, this is what we did and this is why it was successful. But the flip side of that, and almost I'd say probably more important, is the things that didn't go well. Uh, this is what went wrong. This is why it went wrong. This is how we get better and make sure the next time it happens, which it inevitably will, uh, we're more prepared to handle it. So, you know, there's definitely an evaluation period as a head coach and even as an assistant. What can we do better? Because there's always an end goal in sight, right? The short-term goals and the long-term goals that we talked about. Well, it's great to hear. And so many coaches, obviously, if you don't do that, need to start to practice because just that evaluation makes you such a better coach. So it's great. Uh, coach, you've, you've mentioned, sure. yeah, you've mentioned this a few times and, and it, it, it's a bit of a trend too, is this offensive and defensive coordinator thing, although it's existed for, you know, different teams and different organizations. But, you know, when I look at someone like you, I mean, you're, you're a basketball coach, you can coach any side of the ball, you can coach anywhere in the world like you're a basketball coach so as a young coach is there a danger in thinking that I have to define myself as one or the other and that we should really be focusing on them being the best coach they can be and clearly at younger levels there's no definition of offense and defense you gotta do it all but uh, I think sometimes when we get in these conversations I mean probably even the coach that is a defensive coordinator would rather be called a basketball coach is that fair I think to a certain degree Maybe it's always what helps the most at a particular time, right? But I mean, first of all, I'd like to say thanks. I appreciate, thank you. I appreciate what you know you said. I appreciate the compliment. But I do think with basketball, the the pace at which the game is played, the game clearly impacts itself on both ends of the floor. Meaning, offense. Everybody talks about it you know, offense is impacting defense and defense clearly impacts offense. You know, the obvious like, hey, we get a steal or a rebound and a long outlet. We run into our break and we get an easy basket. Okay, defense to offense, you, you know, let your defense create your offense. But there's, you know, numerous ways to do it the other way where, you know, running a slower paced offense, you know, has a tendency to make the scores lower. Well, that's why offensive and defensive rating became so uh, in vogue and still is, and rightfully so, because if there were less possessions, you were scoring less points, but you may not, you actually may be scoring at a higher rate, which was misperceived. As far as, you know, offensive and defensive coaches, I think sometimes that's a label that gets put on people and right or wrong in some cases. And, you know, that in of itself can be a statistical analysis that can be done. If somebody wanted to do it. But I, I do think there are guys that are very knowledgeable and very helpful for teams on in certain levels, you know, because of the way they teach, because of their knowledge, uh, because of the players that they have. And this is what we talked about in terms of having unique players. When you have certain guys that can, when you have guys that can do certain things, you want to put them in the best spots to be successful. So usually your coordinators or guys that have knowledge in that area or, you know, expertise, you want to make sure that they're, you know, getting the opportunity to voice that opinion. I do think it's really important though that you don't just label somebody as something and they stay within their box, uh, you know, we we always talk about, hey, let's think outside the box. Well, okay, well, then we got to make sure we don't put people in boxes um, and make them think only one way because there's a lot of great minds out there. I love that. That's a, that's a great way of saying it, Coach, for sure. So having, again, coached playoff basketball, you know, a lot of different situations, what – is the detail, the intensity, what happens that's so different? Is it just 
everything's heightened because we have more prep time? Is it because players are playing that much harder? Or, you know, what is the real change when we watch playoff basketball? I think the biggest thing is that you're seeing the best. So now you've got the best teams. Now you've got them playing each other game after game after game. As you said, because they're when you're playing game one of the season, it's everybody's locked in. Like it's all right. It's brand new. Here we go. It's the game. But win or lose that game, you have other games to grow from. Like you can get better. You definitely want to like we're competitors. If we can go 82 and 0, I yet to meet somebody who doesn't want to go 82 and 0. But (laughs) there's a cost to doing it, right? There's, okay, what is our goal? What is our purpose in terms of what is our end goal? What are we trying to do? This is what we talked about earlier with, you know, the vision of your team. Where are we trying to go? How are we going to get there? So fast forward, you play in a playoff game. Well, it isn't, if you lose game one, you don't have 81 more games to work with here you can lose three times in a playoff series and still win it. I mean, playing the NBA finals, you can go four and three and be NBA champions. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. So you, when you step into that game, you don't want, you know, at the end, you don't want to be down. If you are down one game, it's not the end of the world. You still have a chance, but, it's it's significantly harder because now you have to do whatever you did. So let's say the game comes down to a last second shot and the ball goes in the basket and your team loses the game. Okay, to get that win, to get that win back, you gotta go through everything that you just went through. You gotta go through, you know, however, what is it, forty seven minutes and you know, fifty fifty seven seconds to get back to that spot. And so you have, that's why it's the time frame is significantly shorter. So you have to, you know, step up sooner. You have to be prepared. And that's why I think when you look at teams who play in these series and they can win game one, game two, and all of a sudden they can sweep a series, that's such a huge advantage because they can now regroup, get ready for their next opponent. Uh, because that, and it also talks about the level, are you going to be healthy? Are you going to be able to, how are you going to get through these each series? Cause you have to do it four times, but all the things that you said, uh, are impactful in terms of why the playoffs are up, but it's also, you now have the eight, eight best teams in each conference. They're going head to head multiple games against each other. The best players are, you know, stepping up their level. And I think one thing that always goes, I shouldn't say always goes unnoticed, but I think before every series starts, everybody's talking about player A and B on each team. Uh, but inevitably, players C, D, and E, or one of those guys come in and have an impact. And they're not, I'm just referencing them as those players, but like a good example is uh, the things that Fred Van Vliet did this year for Toronto. Uh, not a lot of people were talking about him, but if you were the opposing coach, (laughs) you certainly knew who he was when you were playing in games and you knew how much he had impacted their games throughout the year. But then when the playoffs came along, you know, a lot of people might not have been talking about him, but he delivered. And, And that's just one example. That's just one name. You could come up with hundreds through the years and even in a particular playoff season. So that's what makes it amazing is not only are the guys going all out, which uh, they go all out more times than people say, but they think you know, like a lot of people say, oh, it's the playoffs. No, guys are given what they've got for sure. But they're, you know, it's the best of the best. And as you advance, it just keeps, you know, like, that's it. Like you are playing, you better play your next best series if you advance because that team's going to be that much better. Well, it, it's it's so fun to watch, and I imagine it's even more fun to experience. And, Coach, I can't thank you enough for taking some time and uh, sharing the game with us and uh, sharing so many insights into, you know, coaching in general, but certainly coaching at the NBA level as well. So thank you so much for taking some time. Thanks, Chris. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Coach, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, sounds good. Appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening to the podcast, Coach. I want to share with you something I'm so happy to finally be opening up. It's our basketball immersion training or BI training. We were doing a live five-day training camp specifically for college and pro players. It's taking place in my new hometown of Palm Desert, California, and the closest airport is PSP or Palm Springs Airport. This location is just two hours from LAX and is a beautiful spot to learn a game's approach and to improve decision making. I've had many coaches ask me over and over how to develop players and train decision making in the off season. Well, here it is, a five-day player development academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th, 2019. I'm running this basketball immersion training for your players to attend and learn through eight on-court sessions, three video sessions, and group training practices like you've never seen before. You know my love for random practice and transferring skills to games, and these training sessions will be run with a player development focus. This is a full week of me teaching players to be their own coach and to make your life even easier. Come learn for yourself how to best teach your players to make better decisions through group off-season decision training. Send this link to your players ASAP, www.basketballimmersion.com slash BI training. Come join me for a five-day player development academy in Palm Desert, California, August 12th to 16th, 2019. Hurry, spots are limited. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.